Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Philip. If you have any questions or feedback, just tweet me. That's my Twitter handle there. It's a rot13 of my last name. Um, so as we said, I am from Vienna, city of fatty foods, classical architecture, and beautiful women. <laughs> or probably not. Um, so uh, in Vienna, I organize two meetups, one more geared towards databases, the other one towards uh, papers. Uh, and I work at a small company doing EDI, Electronic Data Interchange, uh, which is kind of the automated ordering of stuff and invoicing. So if you buy something in a supermarket like beer, at one point they will run out of beer and they will generate a new order for beer and then they will give that order to us and we will process it and make sure it gets to the beer manufacturer. So actually, pretty bad things happen if we screw up because there won't be any beer. So, yeah, that's our main security motivation. We want to give you your beer. Um, so in general, who uses some cloud service like Amazon, Azure? Great. Um, isn't the cloud great because you can just scale up so easily, but does it solve all your security issues? Um, unfortunately, no, it's not. Um, still, I think if you configure it correctly, the cloud will be much more secure than most data centers you will either put up yourself or some crappy host you will use. So if you use it correctly, cloud services, I'm talking particularly about Amazon, uh, will be a great benefit. But the thing is, if you use it correctly. Why is it important that you use it correctly? Many bad things have happened in the past. So for example, there was something called code spaces, which was some kind of like GitHub. So you could store your code there and your assets and I think your issues and everything. And yeah, this was their final message um, because somebody got their AWS key from the cloud and just deleted everything. And then they were gone and they didn't have any external backups and yeah, they had to shut down. Uh, or another example would be DrawQuest, which was a game which was, I don't know, I've never heard of it, but it had some thousand users who were loyally playing it for a long time. And at some point, um, somebody got their key and started mining bitcoins for a lot of money, and they neither had the money to pay their Amazon bill anymore, nor had they the resources to clean up, so they had to shut down as well. Or another nice example was Bonsai, which is hosted Elasticsearch. Um, someone, probably their competition, got their Amazon keys and shut down everything at 2 a.m. at night. And in the morning when they woke up, all the alert systems were beeping because everything was gone. And it took like 48 hours to restore all the stuff they had. So, yeah. So again, somebody got their API key and crashed everything. I know how you feel now. It's probably time for a drink. Uh, but let's, yeah, let's try to comfort you a bit and show you uh, how to make your stuff more secure. So we'll take a look at how to secure your Amazon account or generally your cloud infrastructure in 101 easy steps. So I'll start speaking much faster now just to go through 101 steps. Um, so let's start with zero, your account. Um, with Amazon, you get a root account, which is like you would expect, the root account can do everything, and there are just no restrictions at all for your root account. So the first thing when you create your Amazon account is you get your root account, and after that, you just take that and lock it away. Never use it. Don't even look at it. Um, instead, use uh, the identity management Amazon provides you. It's called IAM, uh, where you can create different users and roles. And it's really powerful. It just has a strange name. It's called I am. But there is an easy way to remember why it's called I am. I'll show you. I am what I am. Right. So it's just I am what I am. So that's the access management. So you are what you are uh, based on the I am configuration. So 
for each user you have, for each resource you have, for each, each external service you use, which needs some kind of access to Amazon. Just use IAM, create a dedicated user for that. So if somebody steals those credentials or if somebody breaks in, into a third party system, just revoke those uh, credentials and you're good to go. Just do it. Um, next, once you've set up your accounts, you need to set up uh, access properly. Like you would do with any other system, you would only allow what's absolutely necessary. So the principle of the least access is also valid. Uh, so the first thing is you can do uh, permissions based per person or per account. Don't do that. Create groups uh, to manage permissions so you can easily reuse them. And a single user can belong to multiple groups, so you can even have like a shared uh, configuration setup. Um, it's a bit intimidating at first uh, because this would be a very simple rule, um, but it's really, really powerful. So in this example, I would say uh, S3 is the file storage on Amazon, and I would just create every user that has these rules would be allowed to list all my buckets, which is just like the basic folders you have on S3. Uh, and then for the bucket com, example, backup, everything in there, uh, you can put objects there, you can delete objects, and you can read objects. And for example, if this one would be a backup user, just take away the delete permission from the user. Because if you want to create backups, uh, you just want to push the backups there. You don't necessarily need, need to remove those backups automatically. So if somebody just compromises that user, uh, he couldn't remove the backups you have stored. So, like in the code spaces example from the beginning, they couldn't remove all the things you have put there. Um, yeah, they just could add new backups, which they probably wouldn't do, but nothing bad could happen. Um, next up, luckily, uh, 101 is just in binary, so we are progressing nicely. Um, authentication. Uh, the obvious thing is use strong passwords. Uh, I guess everybody knows horse staple, the how to memorize nice passwords. The better option probably would even be to use a proper password manager. Um, but yeah, this is also fine. Uh, and the second thing is uh, use multi-factor authentication. Um, so like on my phone, I have the Google app, and it will just a uh, token which expires every 60 seconds. And you just need that to log in. So you have your email address, your account, your password, and your two-factor authentication code for login. And without that, you can't do anything. So even if I gave you my regular credentials without my two-factor authentication code, you couldn't uh, access anything. Um, the only thing you need to be slightly aware of is what it happens if your two-factor authentication device breaks. So with a regular IAM account, there's no problem, because you can either reset it with another powerful IAM account, or your root account can also uh, revert those credentials, and you can just use your new phone. What happens if your root device, or your, the device for your root account, uh, gets busted? That's more difficult. Uh, you have some kind of backup options where you can put in questions and answers. Uh, we thought we were very clever and just wanted to avoid another loophole and just put random strings into the answers, which we didn't write down, so we didn't have those uh, backup questions. And then, so believe me, it wasn't me. Uh, it was on the phone of a colleague, and he broke his phone. And so we were locked out of our root account, and it's really hard to get back in. I mean, it's good of Amazon that they make that really hard, but it kind of required a notary in Austria who had to sign forms, and we had to send it to Luxembourg, and it was really a, an expensive and long process. So uh, for your root account, don't destroy your two-factor authentication device. It's really a pain. Next, uh, considering your code, there's just a single uh, simple rule. Uh, never commit your credentials in clear text. Because the common thing that happens is you have some internal thing uh, where you put in your credentials, and then at some later point, you decide, oh, it would be nice if we could open source that. And then you just take your code. Uh, maybe you have even just deleted the stuff from the repository, but it's somewhere in the history still. 
and you open source it, and somebody will find those credentials. And that's really a very common way to compromise your account. So never uh, commit your credentials in clear. Next up, networking. Uh, for us, uh, IP restrictions are the most valuable things. So this is kind of the configuration my own user is using. Uh, so I have like allow everything on every resource, but only allow that from certain IP addresses. So we have only whitelisted our office IP address and our VPN server. And even if I gave you my credentials and my two-factor authentication code, you couldn't use it because you don't access anything from those IP addresses. So I don't think that any other service except from Amazon has that, but it's really powerful because even if somebody gets your tokens, uh, nothing bad can happen. So that's really powerful. Uh, the only thing that's kind of surprising is uh, even if you come from another IP, you can still log into Amazon. It just looks like that. So it will just tell you for everything you're not allowed to do that because your IP address matches, doesn't match. Um, but you can still log in uh, because this is kind of like an API and just all the API accesses fail and you just get a broken interface, kind of. So really, the IP restrictions are a lifesaver. Uh, next up, tools. So Amazon provides quite a lot of useful tools. Um, the first thing is billing alerts. Normally, you get your monthly statement at the end of the month. So the bad guys are normally pretty clever. If they want to mine bitcoins, they will wait for, I don't know, like the second of the month or so. So they have quite a long period just to start mining bitcoins or whatever cryptocurrency. Uh, so if you enable uh, billing alerts, you can just say, um, I don't know, you know uh, approximately what your monthly billing should be. Uh, so you just put an alert a little lower than that, and you know, okay, we know at the middle of the month we get one alert email, and at the end of the month we get another alert. So I think like we have a $1,000 alert in the middle of the month uh, and one at the end for 2000 And if those arrive earlier, we know either we have screwed up and configured something badly, which is expensive, or somebody broke into our, our account. But we'll get this email, so we will know pretty soon something bad has happened. Um, then there is something called CloudTrail, which just logs every API call. Because one common problem is if somebody has compromised the system, you don't know which account it was. So it's, at first you start looking around, okay, which key could have been compromised, what is the service that is affected. Uh, with CloudTrail, that gets much easier. Uh, one example is here, I think an instance has been shut down, uh, and you know, okay, this instance has been shut down by this specific, specific key, and it was at that time, and you just have all the required information. So if some, sometimes you discover, okay, all my machines have been uh, shut down, uh, you just need to look into crowd trail, and then you see, okay, it was this API key. I need to disable this API key, and from then on, I can just try to build up everything again. And you don't need to hunt around logs, which have probably been destroyed as well, uh, who did what. Um, then there's something called your security status, where you can see for all accounts, uh, have you enabled your two-factor authentication? Do you have a good password? You can set up password rules, everything. So there you have just a few points. They should be green, and you know, OK, you have probably set up your credentials correctly. And finally, uh, if you have support, there's something called the trusted advisor, which will tell you uh, the things you're doing badly. Uh, so here you have, you can save money, you can improve your performance, you can improve your security and your fault tolerance. So you have four points, and there you have like green, yellow, red, and you know, okay, these are the things uh, you need to improve. Good. So these are the basic steps, and now just some implementation details. Um, first off, what should you do if your key is compromised? Um, just reset the key. Even if you have just pushed it to GitHub for like three minutes to a public repository, uh, reset it. Because the bad guys are unfortunately pretty clever. Uh, they just uh, will 
uh, getting all the pushes you push to GitHub. So even if you rebase and revert the history or change the history, uh, once you have pushed out the key, uh, the bad guys might have gotten it, and there's just way to know, no way to know. So just reset the key once you think it has been compromised. Secondly, where should you actually store your key? Because I said, don't put it into version control. So there are two common approaches. Uh, the 12-factor authentication uh, manifesto uh, tells you, OK, put it into environment variables. Or we do it, we just put the encrypted credentials into our source code. Like, we push it to GitHub, but it's encrypted with a really strong uh, password. So even if somebody compromises our GitHub account, he won't get any uh, meaningful keys. Um, somebody wrote a pretty nice blog post about it. He is called E. John. I don't know if anybody has heard of him. He wrote some little JavaScript thing nobody has ever used, probably. Um, and what he does, basically, is just a really simple shell script. And he says, OK, just take the file with your credentials, uh, run it through that which will encrypt it, use the same script just to decrypt it, uh, and you're good to go. Just use a really strong password, and that will do it. Uh, it's just, yeah, it uses OpenSSL uh, with proper settings, and everything should be good. And for us, just we have like a Java certificate store. We call it Trust Store in this example. Uh, here we have just the encrypted thing, just after pulling everything down from GitHub. Then we just run our encrypt decrypt thing on it. Uh, and then we have the decrypted thing, and everything is good. And when we change it, we just run the same script on the decrypted file to encrypt it, and then we can push it again safely. And we change the file extension, so the, the decrypted file is in our git ignore, so nobody can ever push that by, the, by accident. Uh, but there are other options. So you can, if you're using Ansible, there's Ansible Vault. If you are more on the HashiCorp th stuff like uh, Vega and all their tools, they have HashiCorp Vault, and there are many other solutions. So just use something that fits your system, and it will take away your problems. So for us, uh, everything containing credentials is just an encrypted file. So we just push the encrypted file to GitHub. Our build server just takes it. It doesn't see the credentials because it's still encrypted there. Then we push our, since we're using Java, our JAR files uh, to uh, S3 to store them. From there, we deploy them to our instances. And just on the instance, we decrypt the credentials. So only our own instances can see the access credentials. And all the systems in between just get the encrypted version and cannot do anything bad with it. Um, so generally, we need to trust GitHub, we need to trust our build server, and we need to trust Amazon, but we don't trust any other systems. So there would be some kind of nice uh, integrations with GitHub, but often they need access to your source control or your source code, and we just don't do that, because if it's like a really small company with three people, I'm sure they're trying to do their best, but they are definitely not equipped to do proper security audits, and they. Yeah, it's just too easy for them to screw up. So for example, we wanted to use Whoboard, which is kind of a project management tool on top of GitHub issues. Uh, but they would need access to our code, and we simply said, no, it's not worth the risk. We were trying to avoid that. And if you're really big and you don't trust your colleagues, there's a nice uh, project called GitRob, which will check your source code for credentials and will alert you that you have committed something you shouldn't. So to sum up, um, I'll just give you two more examples of stuff you, where stuff has gone wrong, and I'm sure you can tell uh, what the errors were. So somebody has committed his uh, three credentials, uh, and a short while after that, 140 servers were running. And he pushed it to GitHub, but within five minutes, he realized he had done something bad and wanted to reset, or he actually uh, then wanted to reset the key, uh, but it was too late the servers were always started. So first, never commit your credentials. If your stuff has been compromised, rotate the keys immediately. Set up billing alerts so you will get to know earlier. And yeah, just never commit your credentials. Or that was a very recent blog post where somebody said, yeah, there was a bug in Visual Studio uh, which would automatically open source your project. He thought he was uh, doing, or he created a private repository, and it was, in fact, public. Um, 
But still, if you don't commit your credentials, uh, it doesn't matter. Even if you, by accident, uh, pub uh, publish a private repository, if there are no credentials, the harm is not so big. OK. That's it. Any questions? Any questions? Great talk, thank you. So you mentioned you encrypt the file where you keep the credentials, so, uh, and you encrypt it with a really strong password. Where do you store that password for encrypting credentials? All right, so within our company, I think everybody is using one password, and there we have just have stored these kind of master passwords. And what is also an additional benefit kind of is that uh, even if you have external people working on your code, they just don't get that password. And we can just give them the source code, but they don't get the credentials. So if you don't trust someone or don't trust him yet, uh, you don't need to give that out. And our encrypt and decrypt uh, script just puts like an echo where it says, OK, if you don't have the credentials and you should have them, email operations at our company. And if they email me, I will just give them the credentials if they need them. But for these, uh, like these master passwords, everybody use or manages them for him or herself. So it's just like an offline version. And we trust for everyone to use them properly. But like in our company, we've mandated everybody uses full disk encryption and everybody uses a proper password manager. So we hope it's secure. But that's just like, since we're a small company, it's just easy just to do that everybody on his or her own. But I guess it would even scale to bigger companies because that password doesn't change often. Yes. So you deploy a decrypted file on production, right? Yes. So why not then uh, in deploy process implement a clear text password and not, and not encrypt it in the process of building? So what's, what, why is it different if you have it in one place? Because it can change or? I mean, you have a password uh, encrypted and then you decrypt it and deploy password in the clear text so now the Password file or configuration file with password uh, on production is in clear text, right? Well, we, we have it uh, encrypted uh, all the way until it gets onto the instance, and just on the instance itself, we decrypt it. But somewhere you need the password in the clear text, so your application needs the, the database uh, password in the clear text. Okay, somewhere. so in theory, you have. Um, one file with all the passwords that are encrypted, and you only have one password to decrypt that store uh, in the build process, instead of having uh, 10 passwords locally for database for everything. So each developer will need to have 10 passwords for, for database for some other services in order to deploy. Um, so actually, uh, we do everything with Ansible, and we just have an kind of an Ansible secret, and it's just the deploy stage just takes the right passwords and puts them onto the instance, just the required ones. Um, yeah, you kind of could split it up, but most of our instance or most of our applications just share the same credentials. So you share the same database access and stuff like that. Um, but we can even split it up. So we use a different password for development, staging, and production. So if you're new to the team, you probably only get uh, the password for development, and you can only uh, even push to development then and decrypt the development stuff. And production is strictly separated, so only the trusted people get that master password. Thanks. Hi, uh, how long does, I know you can, when you screw up royally and publish credentials to GitHub, you can kind of send them a letter of apology, can you please remove it from your history so that it isn't uh, in, the, in the repo? Uh, so how long does it usually take them to kind of clear things up? Sorry, how, how does it long, how long does <laughs> how it take long, the people to, the bad take, people to uh, find it? Uh, no, how long does it take GitHub administration to help you clean up your own mess <laughs> when you yeah. publish stuff to GitHub. So um, I'm not sure that 
GitHub themselves will help you. You can just rebase yourself and push the stuff. No, it's still available. If you push it, if you, for instance, go to the like hash in the URL, uh, it's still right. available online. So you need to ask them to, can you please kind of kill still, it? Still, <laughs> it, it won't save you. You just have to reset the key. If it has been out uh, just for a minute, uh, you ha even have it in the pushes or it, uh, if you uh, subscribe to the push screen of a repository, you can have just you just get it because the bad guys normally just subscribe to your pushes, and if you've pushed it out once, I would say no, no, I it's com I completely get it's it. broken. This so is just you know covering your tracks so that that commit never existed. You know. I don't know how long it takes GitHub to just remove that, but we just consider it broken and reset it. You know. We have time for one more question after this. Hi. Uh, how do you secure data in the cloud? Uh, like in Germany, they have a law that all the customer data, all the transactions and everything must not be uh, outside of the Germany. But they also allow if you have some uh, encryption of the dr disks on SQL since some e 9001. Yes, so this is probably a longer answer. The shorter answer is... Do you have time after the talk? Yeah, we can talk afterwards, but just quickly. Um, so first off, we've moved to Amazon in Frankfurt. So we have a lot of German customers, so we have everything in Germany. Uh, we encrypt ourselves uh, the critical stuff in the database. So if somebody steals our dump, he doesn't get anything. Uh, I think that the disk encryption on databases is mainly for compliance because normally the attacker will just attack your application and your application needs to read the data in the clear text. So it's, I think that's just for compliance reasons, to have the full disk encryption on database servers. Um, but you can discuss it in detail afterwards. Hi. Uh, a question about uh, an early part where you said uh, you should have a separate API key for deleting uh, the backups. Can you name an example backup software solution that actually supports this kind of stuff? Um, actually, we have just written our own shell scripts, which will work accordingly. I'm, I'm sorry, so we just have, like, we're using a monitoring tool to monitor our shell scripts, so we know they run, like, every hour or every night, like, we want to configure them, so they're just, like, what is it called? I, I don't know. I, I can tell you afterwards. Uh, so there are tools just to monitor your cron jobs, and we just use uh, a shell script, so we know, okay, they run, and they will just be able to put our stuff to the backup server, but they are not able to delete our backups. I don't know if there are any solutions. I, I guess there should be, but I'm not aware of any. So we're just using tiny shell scripts just to do the right thing we, we need them to do. <laughs>